Pastor Josh Dockstetter here from Center Point Church in Montague, Prince Edward Island. Thank you for viewing this sermon from one of our weekly worship meetings. I do hope that it will encourage and challenge you towards a maturity in Christ. We at Center Point believe in the local church, and we want to remind you that this sermon should only support the role and influence that your pastor and church family should have on your life and not replace it. If you aren't a part of the local church, I want to simply say, don't rob yourself of the presence of others in gospel community, and don't rob others of your presence in gospel community. Find a church that preaches the word of God, makes much of Jesus, and is committed to discipleship. And may the following sermon enrich you in the gospel for the glory of God. All right, well, if you have your Bibles, uh, we are going to ask that you turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, as we continue going through the Lord's Prayer together. For those of you who may be just joining us, um, we are taking this summer to really focus in on what it means to be a people who pray. And we're taking the example that our Lord has given us in how to pray, um, and we're taking it line by line, looking at each aspect of the Lord's Prayer, and it's been a very challenging and a very encouraging, at the same time, uh, study for us as we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We began the Sermon on the Mount January, I think it was the first Sunday in January, and this is going to take us all the way to the end of November, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, how things have been plotted out, and then we'll start something for Christmas, but I don't want to even start thinking about Christmas at this time. And we're hoping for the good, warm weather, and uh, we're looking forward to um, the summer that is ahead. So I'm going to ask that you turn to Matthew chapter 6. We, how we are doing this each week, um, like we've done the past couple of weeks, is we are going to pray the Lord's Prayer. It will be on the screen behind me, as you can see. Um, and so we're going to ask that you would stand as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, and we will recite it as it is on the screen there. This is taken from the ESV. If you have a different translation, that's totally okay. But this is what we are going to be looking at here today. Let us pray to our Father in heaven together today as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, again, as I said, the aim and focus of this series is that we would become a people who pray, not just publicly together as a church, but also individually, that the things that we are learning here from God's Word together would inspire us and drive us to a deeper connection with God individually. The last, last week we talked about, we entered into a new section of the Lord's Prayer, which is the main body of what the Lord's Prayer is about, and that is making requests of God. You remember our approach to God is that He is our Father in heaven. It is, there's no other word used there. Jesus thought it was so important that we understand God as Father, and not just our Father specifically, but a Father in heaven implying the authority of God over all things, that God rules and reigns. And we're going to look at that especially today when we look at his kingdom coming. Last week we looked at, we talked about how God wants to hear our requests and the Lord's Prayer is broken up into two sections. You'll notice that the first three requests, verses, 10, uh, verses 9 and 10 say, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is calling us to see the glory of God. And when we, when we pray and plead for the glory of God to be seen and known in our world, it then prepares us to then make requests of him for what we need. So there's two sections in the Lord's Prayer. God's glory and our dependence upon him. We see that in the second 
half of the Lord's Prayer where it says, give us this daily bread, forgive us our debts, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We see that those things fit with the Lord's Prayer. And we looked last week about, at the greatest request, the request that fuels all the other requests, and that is that God's name would be hallowed. That word hallowed is, is quite an old Archaic sounding word, but it means to be made holy, made sacred. That God would be revealed as he truly is in our world. As different, as holy, as great as God. That he would be revealed and that his name would be hallowed. And so now today we look at how God's name will be fully hallowed. The consummation, the, the fullness of God's hallowedness and made sacred is, it, it points to this great end, and that is the kingdom of God. This is essentially, if I had to describe to you the main theme of the, Lord, of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is trying to put forward to us, it is this, the kingdom of God. Jesus is describing, is revealing for us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, what the kingdom of God looks like in the world, what citizens of the kingdom look like, how they live, how they act, how it's different than the world. Jesus is putting this forward for us. And so he calls us to, today to pray that his kingdom may come in fullness. You know, knowing God as Father when we enter into a relationship with God as Father, and we know his holiness and his greatness, the hallowedness of his name, it points us to an ultimate ending. It points us to a, a zenith. It points us to the climax of, of what this is all about, what life is all about, what existence is all about. And the amazing thing about it is that while it's the ending of this life that we all know fairly well and have experienced its ups and downs, the kingdom of God coming in fullness is a new beginning. It is a new beginning and what a great beginning it is for us. Now the problem is when we think about God's kingdom coming, we actually find ourselves hard pressed to be thinking about God's kingdom coming, do we not? Because we've limited our sight to the kingdom of this world. And as such, our sight becomes limited. We become so fixed and focused on the kingdom of this world. We 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 give ourselves over to the struggles and the happiness of this life, and those things draw us and draw our attention away and draw us to look at the things in this world more than the eternal kingdom of God who is going to come in fullness and in glory. And as such, our lives are driven by our experiences, by the things we face. We think that the fullness of life is what we want. Having that thing that we think will make us feel better, or God, if you would just take that thing away from me, maybe that you take that struggle away from me in life, then that would be what the fullness of life is all about. But Jesus is saying, no, there's something greater, there's something more. The kingdom of God coming in fullness that we as God's people get to hope for. Isn't this an amazing thing? Because the things of this world, if we read the scriptures, we will see that the things of this world are not fulfilling, nor are they lasting. Because we'll always want more. And we'll always keep giving ourselves over to the things of this world. Never finding fulfillment. Never finding true, lasting joy. And so what Jesus is calling us to here today is to pray for God's kingdom to come. And I would put before you that when we pray for God's kingdom to come, although it is a future hope, it's something that strengthens life in this world in the here and now. It's actually something that can give fullness of life here and now because it is something lasting, it is something preserving. As Christians, we are called to keep our hope fixed on things above. Colossians 3, verse 1. It says for us to, to, 
set our sights, since we've been risen with Christ, set our eyes on things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We are to look to him. And when we look to him, it does just as much earthly good as it does heavenly good. As C.S. Lewis has said, you know, those who are the, it's not that those who are the most heavenly minded are of no earthly good, it's actually the opposite. Those who are the most heavenly minded are actually the most earthly good because it's the people who think the most of the next life who think the most of eternal life with God in heaven, those are the people that are driven to impact this world for the glory of God. And that's what Jesus is calling us here to today. So let's dive into this simple phrase of three words in verse 10. Your kingdom come. Now there's three things I want us to see. The first is this, how we are to anticipate and hope for the kingdom, what God has revealed that his kingdom is and how it is coming. So how is it that we hope for something? We hope for something. Think about how hope is birthed in us. We, we get hope for something by understanding what's coming to us, at least, if, if at the very least, in part, what, something, what it is that we're hoping for and what it means for us. Now, I'll illustrate it this way. A, a couple of weeks ago, this past month in June, um, at, at the beginning of June, we start preparations for my son's birthday party. My wife starts, you know, trying to make decisions. She's found her hobby, and it is in cake making. So the last couple of years, it's been Lego cakes, right? Like, she's, like, my son just is right into Lego. And so when June comes around, he sees all the preparations starting for making the cake, planning the birthday party. Now, he knows what this means. He's not experienced it fully yet, Right? But he knows what it means, and he hopes for it. He knows what the birthday party means, the friends that will come, the cake that he will have, the cards that um, he will get, the presents, of course, that he will get, and the love that will be poured out on him. See, that's what hope looks like. And we must understand that the same God who is Father and who is holy, friends, He has a plan. He's not sitting there idle, twiddling his thumbs. Like over the last couple of weeks, we've seen who God is, that he's Father, that he's holy, his name must be hallowed, and today we see that God has a plan and a purpose, and he's making preparations for his kingdom to come in fullness. God is doing something. Let me just draw your attention to what the whole of Scripture tells us about what God is doing. We begin in Genesis chapter 1 with God creating all things, and in Genesis 2, planting a garden, a garden called Eden. And it's in that place where, in a garden, you might wonder, like, why does God plant a garden? Why doesn't he just make a palace, you know? Or why doesn't he make this awesome, cool city? No, God plants a garden. You ever thought about why it's a garden? In, in, for those of you who are gardeners, maybe you, you might know. In a garden, life is seen. In a garden, there's much production, right? There's growth. And in a garden, beauty is put on display. You know, this is, this, I think that gardens are actually a, a far better representation of what a kingdom is than a palace because in a garden we see life, we see production, we see beauty put on display. And I believe this is why God plants a garden because he's, he's trying to put forward to us this idea of what his kingdom will be like. But I would put it before you in this way. God's kingdom as it's defined in Scripture and as we see in the Sermon on the Mount, is far more than just a geographical place. It's not simply this um, structure or this gathering of structures put within a perimeter of a wall. It's not a palace. It's not a bunch of buildings. Rather, God's kingdom in the Bible is put forward as his authority and his ideals, his values put together in community. And that's what the garden 
represents. God reveals his beauty, his glory, his grace, his goodness, and he does so in connection to his creation. And the most prized of his creation, that being mankind. Made in God's image. And then as we know in Genesis 3, the rebellion happens where Satan and sin and death are brought into this world and man falls into sin and we are separated from God's authority. We are separated from God's ideals and we are separated from God's community. Like man is kicked out of the garden and God places an angel in front of the garden to hold back lest man get back into the garden. And yet, in the midst of the curses that are put upon man, in Genesis chapter 3, there is a message of hope that one day there will come one from the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head and will establish the kingdom of God. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament. We see God making promises to his people, to Abraham, to David. To Abraham, he says, he says that he will make of him a great nation and all nations will be blessed through him. And then to David, he says, you will not fail to have a king on the throne. And all of this is pointing to this kingdom of God that is going to come in fullness. So all throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament with the Pharisees, with the, with the Jewish leaders, the, these people, you've got to understand, when Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of God, this is something that tugged on their heartstrings. This is something that pulled them in deeper, that they're expecting God's kingdom to come again, to rule and to reign why? Because they held on to these promises of which God has promised to them. And then Jesus steps on the scene. Jesus steps on the scene and begins preaching this message. Jesus, keep in mind, this guy who comes from very humble beginnings, born of a carpenter, like not a very royal looking person comes onto the scene and he begins preaching this message. And it's, it's a very prominent message all throughout Matthew. John the Baptist, the precursor to Jesus, comes along in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2 and says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand. And Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, right before he starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount and says the exact same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So now we ask, okay, where is it? Like much of the Jews in that day, where is the kingdom of heaven? Where's the kingdom of God? And as we read the Gospels, we see the kingdom of heaven in this. We see the kingdom of heaven in Jesus' humble life, in his teachings, his proclamation, his kingdom edicts. And then we see the kingdom of heaven in Jesus Christ being arrested and tortured and put on a cross. We see the kingdom of heaven displayed in Jesus' life, his death, and then we see the kingdom of heaven displayed in Jesus' resurrection. His conquering of death and sin, where the stone is rolled away and life bursts forward in fullness. Now, for many of us and for people in this world and for the Jews at that time, you got to... Put yourself in their shoes for a moment. This? That's the kingdom of heaven? That's the kingdom of God? Is that really what it is? How is that the kingdom of God? How is the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of this man, this Messiah, how is that the kingdom of God? Well, it's important for us to understand What's being said here? Maybe some of you out there 
like to do things with your hands. Maybe you're builders, maybe you're artists, maybe you like to knit and sew, and maybe you like to plant gardens, right? Now I'd say on the island there's quite a few of, if not a couple of those, in this room here today. Now say if those of you who like to knit, and I'll, I'll address something maybe a little bit more guy-focused after if you want, um, but <laughs> for those of you who like to knit, how many times do you get people walking by you as you're knitting and asking you, what is that? And how many times do you respond, oh, it's a sweater, or it's a pair of mittens, or it's a toque, or on and on the list might go. Now, for me, who doesn't knit, I walk by and I ask what that is, and I'm like, no, it's not. That's not a sweater. That's string. That's what it is. There's a ball of yarn right here. That's what it is. Or for those of you who like to build, you know, you've you got all this wood that you pull out and you've got all your supplies and all your tools and you've laid them all out, or maybe not. You just got them all over the place and someone walks by and says, hey, what is that? And you're like, oh, that's a, that's a house. No, no, it's not. It's, it's just supplies. It's all these things. Individually. Why? Why can you call that a house? Why can you call that a sweater? Because you see what all of those parts put together symbolizes and means in its fullness. And it's the same with the kingdom of God. That when we look at Jesus' life, when we look at Jesus' death, when we look at his resurrection, when we look at the things that he does in and through our lives, friends, those parts culminate together to create the kingdom of God, that God is working on his kingdom here and now, assembling the parts, and it will be put together in fullness that we will see it in glory. You see... When we look to Jesus' life and death and resurrection, when we look to the promises of God in the word of God, Jesus has also said that after he goes back up to heaven that he will send another helper, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been sent to establish the reality and the parts of the kingdom in believers' hearts. So what we are talking about here when we speak of the kingdom of heaven, friends, is this, a kingdom that is not built with human hands, but a kingdom that is built built with the hands of God in human hearts. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of the heart. Do you see this? I mean, look at this. This is not just a perfect example here of all of God's work, all of who God is at work in creating and bringing together the kingdom of God. The Father promises the Son sacrifices and the Holy Spirit seals and solidifies these things on our hearts. Don't you see? It's all of God at work in all of you. The entire being of God, the Trinity. And when this happens, this lifts our eyes in hope to something that is greater than this world. And we begin to see God's power and presence at work here in our lives and in the lives of others. And so we are to anticipate the kingdom. This is the kingdom revealed. God has done something to us. It's meant to capture our attention. And when we, ca we have our attention captured in this way, we are then transformed. We are then removed from looking at this world from being distracted by distractions that are distracting the things in this world that just keep taking our focus off of what's really going on. And when we see and when we understand what the kingdom of God is, then, friends, we cannot help but surrender to it. We surrender ourselves to it. And this, it's this that guides and gets us to the heart of prayer, as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. It's when we see what the kingdom of God is and we understand how all these parts are being put together. That God is, is reigning and ruling in the hearts of men and women all throughout the world and building for himself a kingdom. A kingdom where life and beauty and, and, and uh, fullness of life is brought forward. 
It's this that ought to guide and point us to the heart of prayer as we've looked at the last couple of weeks. Last week when we said that John the Baptist's prayer should be ours, less of me and more of him. You see, when we pray, your kingdom come, we are getting to the heart of worship. Worship is ascribing worth to something. We're seeing the worth of God. When we pray, your kingdom come, we understand first from the word your, we understand that it's God's ownership of the kingdom. It's connected to him, who he is, not who we are. It's his kingdom. He reigns and rules over it. And it's your kingdom. It's God's ideals, his authority. It's the fullness of the kingdom present. And this means that it will have victory over evil. Against the kingdoms and rulers of this world. And then when we pray your kingdom come, we are asking it, we are pleading with God that it would come soon that it would come soon. I can't tell you how much our, for those of us who truly understand this, how our hearts move when we hear this. Your kingdom come. How it ought to move us. You know, uh, Phil Newton, he's a pastor in the States, has said something to this effect. To pray your kingdom come without desiring it is taking the Lord's name in vain. To pray your kingdom come without desiring it is just paying lip service to God. It's not a transformation of the heart. It's not showing that our hearts are truly being reigned by God. Now, friends, it's very evident. It's very evident for us to see that God's name is not hallowed here in our world. Jumping back to last week. And it's that, for that reason, why we pray for God's kingdom to come, to come in fullness. And we realize that only God can make this happen. That's why we turn to him in prayer. That's why we turn to him, the author, the source, and we turn to him in prayer and dependence, and we say, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, it's all of God to us in establishing his kingdom, and it's all of us in surrender to his kingdom, to the kingdom of the heart. And this is what prayer ought to look like. We turn to God out of what he's done to us. That's relationship. It's twofold. God to us in revealing the kingdom, in in putting this hope and anticipation in us and us to him in pleading with him and praying to him and connecting with him in relationship that we might know him more and grow and desire God's kingdom to come. And then lastly, we are, it doesn't just stay there. We are to be active in this world. We are to advance the kingdom. Understanding the kingdom puts in us a desire for the kingdom that moves us to advance the kingdom. God's work to us fills us to spill over into God's work through us to others. That it doesn't just stay between you and God, it works through you. That we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God, to proclaim and to live out the ideals, the, the uh, authority of God in our lives. We are to put it on display. Just as a garden puts God's beauty and life on display, we as his people are to put these things of God, the revelation of who he is, on display in our lives. We do that by living under the authority of God, for his ideals, and proclaiming his kingdom. Paul says this in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. It's not for me to live on Sundays is Christ, or for me to live at church is Christ, or for me to live when I got my Bible open is Christ. It's to live is Christ. And then, secondly, we are to preach the gospel. 
We are to use words. We are to use our lives. We are to, in every way, proclaim the gospel. That's not just something that's put upon me as a pastor. That's put upon all of you as Christians. If you are a follower of Christ here today, you are commissioned by God to make disciples, to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. That's not something you pay someone to do for you. That's something that we all must do. We must proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And let me just say it this way. If it is something that's really important to you, if the gospel of Jesus Christ, if the kingdom of God is something that's really important to you, it's going to come out naturally. You ever notice sometimes you get really passionate about something, maybe like your workout routine or a diet that you're on or a certain kind of philosophy with parenting or, you know, some kind of ideal or some like awesome tool maybe you have? You ever notice that the more you think about it, the more you study it, the more you start to like consume those things and take them into your life and into your heart, the more naturally it starts to come up in your conversations? You're talking to someone, you know, about the weather and then you end up somehow talking about this great DeWalt tool, you know? Just somehow it comes out of your, your mouth, it comes out of your heart, it comes out of, you know, who you are and you just start chatting about it and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Because... It was in there in the first place. Friends, do we let the gospel rule over our hearts in that way? That it just so naturally comes out of our hearts and lives? We are to preach the gospel. I want us to think about the kingdom of God in relationship to the kingdoms of this world. I want to do so with the help of, if you could go to the next slide, please. With the help of someone you might or might not know. Are you, are you running the, if you can keep going to the next one, there's a picture that will show up. This guy. I don't, it might be hard to see. Do you see the, who that is? Anyone know who that is? Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte. Guy with really bad acid reflux, or what it seems like from his pictures, right? Napoleon Bonaparte, the French commander. The one who conquered... A lot of Europe during his day had incredible military advancements. There was a time where Napoleon, at the end of his life, expressed the following thoughts while he was exiled on the rock of St. Helena. There, the conqueror of civilized Europe had time to reflect on the measure of his accomplishments. He called to his friend, the Count Montholon, to his side, and he asked him, very plainly, can you tell me who Jesus Christ is, or who he was? And the Count, Count Montholon, he declined to respond. And so Napoleon countered, and I want to share his quote in full. It's a long one, but I want us to quickly walk through it. It will be on the screen behind me in three parts. It says this, Well, I then will tell you who Jesus is. Napoleon speaking. Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, all these conquerors, and I have founded great empires. But upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire upon love. And to this day, millions will die for him. Napoleon says, I think I understand something of human nature. And I tell you, all of these were men. And I am a man, but there is none like him. Jesus Christ was more than a man. I have inspired multitudes with such an enthusiastic devotion that they would have died for me. But to do this, it was necessary that I should be visibly present with the electric influence of my looks, my words, and my voice. I had to be there in person for them to catch the passion, or they had to see me to catch some of that. When I saw men and spoke to them, I lightened up the flame of self-devotion in their hearts. Christ alone has succeeded in so raising the mind of man towards the unseen 
that it becomes insensible to the barriers of time and space. Across a chasm of 1,800 years, and more so because this is when Napoleon was alive hundreds of years ago, Jesus Christ makes a demand which is beyond all others difficult to satisfy. He asks for that which a philosopher may seek in vain, in emptiness, at the hands of his friends, or a father of his children, or a bride of her spouse, or a man of his brother. He asks for the human heart, and he will have it entirely to himself. He demands it unconditionally. And forthwith, his demand is granted. Wonderful. In defiance of time and space, the soul of man and all its powers and faculties becomes an annexation to the empire of Christ. All who sincerely believe in him experience that remarkable supernatural love toward him. This phenomenon is unaccountable. It is altogether beyond the scope of man's creative powers. Time, the great destroyer, is powerless to extinguish this sacred flame. Time can neither exhaust its strength nor can put a limit to its range. This is it which strikes me the most. I've often thought of it. This is it is which proves to me quite convincingly the divinity of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Friends. I know some of you here today are very aware of the kingdom of this world and the weight which you carry for brothers and sisters and sons and daughters and mothers and fathers. And there are times where we are filled with despair where we look to the things of this world, we look at the governments and the kingdoms of this world, and we see things that are not in keeping with who God is, and we worry, and we get anxious. But friends, there is a kingdom far greater that has lasted far longer, that will come in fullness, in greater power, than any of the kingdoms of this world. So I ask you today, are you looking for it? Are you living in light of it? And when we talk about God's kingdom coming, how, what does that stir in your heart? Paul Washer, a pastor again in the States, says this, Christ's lordship is a blessed hope for some and a terrifying nightmare for others. Regardless of our response, it is an unalterable reality. So friends, are we advancing the kingdom of God? See, praying God's kingdom to come strengthens life in this world as we anticipate eternity. And it's not simply a strength in life, as if it's a part of life, it is life. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, which secures us for everything that has happened, will secure us for everything that will happen. Friends, otherwise, to what end are we living for? If this is just some positive thinking, if, this, if there's not a new beginning, Friends, to what end are we living for? Is Christ's return a reality for you? Because if so, it affects how you live now. And we are to advance the kingdom of God even on our knees. Through prayer and through submission, even submitting our very life experiences to Christ. So where do you stand Because, to take it even further, there's only two kingdoms in this world. There's no middle kingdom. You are either at any time in your life advancing the kingdom of God or advancing the kingdom of darkness. There is no middle ground in this. There's no sitting on the fence in this. 
Christ calls for us to understand the reality. You cannot be inactive in this. So I want to close us with this. Final question for us. Do we really want God's kingdom to come? Or do you want him to wait until maybe we succeed in our jobs, in our families? Or maybe we want, no, Jesus, can you just hold off? I, I really, really want to see my children grow up. Or I'm, I'm really waiting for that right person that I'm going to marry. Or I'm waiting for that right job. I'm waiting for that fame. I'm waiting for that fortune. Don't come back until I get those things. See, friends, when we pray your kingdom come, it exposes our hearts to the true desires that are in there. So, friends, we pray and we proclaim not the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is not just that Christ is Savior, but he is also Lord. See, this is more than just a get-out-of-hell-free card. So many people come to Christ and want him as Savior, but they don't want him as Lord. We proclaim the Lordship of Christ that is coming again, and one day every eye will see him. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm going to ask that you'd stand as we pray. Let me close together. Oh God, we pray. Hallowed be your name. We pray that your name would be made holy and that it would produce life in us. We pray that your kingdom would come because we believe you reign. Father, I pray that for those who are here this morning and don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, that today they, their eyes would be lifted to the King, the King of glory. that one day the kingdom of heaven shall come in fullness and Christ will be our Lord. He will be our King. He will reign and rule. So Lord, we proclaim this gospel of the kingdom and may our lives be attuned to it and may we advance your kingdom as we keep praying for it, anticipating it, and looking for it in the days and time to come. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.